All right, so our next tool of monetary policy we're going to look at is the discount rate. So this is the, this is the interest rate um, that banks pay the Federal Reserve for overnight loans in order to meet the uh, required reserve. So here what's happening is banks, if they need emergency cash, can go to the Federal Reserve discount window and they can borrow money. And the rate at which they borrow that money is going to be called the discount rate. Okay, so that's where you get discount from. It's because these banks are borrowing from the Federal Reserve discount window, so therefore um, it's called the discount rate. Now, this discount rate is actually a secondary tool of monetary policy. It functions as a substitute to the federal funds market. Okay, and the federal funds market, um, that is the market at which banks lend to each other, and they lend to each other at what's called the federal funds rate. Okay, so the federal funds rate is the rate at which banks lend to each other. If the bank is borrowing from the Federal Reserve, they borrow at what is called the discount rate. So this discount rate does provide banks with necessary liquidity when they are unable to access uh, federal funds from other private sector banks. However, banks are often reluctant to use the discount window, and the reason is, is it's so embarrassing. Uh, banks are in the business of managing money. If they need to uh, borrow to get that emergency money, that does not um, look uh, that doesn't bode well for them because they look like they can't manage money. It's kind of like a 50-year-old man going and borrowing money from his parents. Uh, it's just uh, fairly embarrassing and you don't want to have to do that. So the discount rate is usually higher than the federal funds rate and they do, and uh, this is done um, for a reason. It's so banks borrow from each other uh, and not the, federal, uh, not the Federal Reserve. All right, so lowering the discount rate is going to uh, be a part of an expansionary monetary policy because what's happening is banks can borrow money from the Federal Reserve cheaper. Uh, because of that, they're going to lend out more of their access reserves, and that's going to be expansionary. If you increase the discount rate, that's going to be contractionary um, because banks, um, they're borrowing from the discount window at a higher interest rate, so they're less likely to lend out their excess reserves, and that's going to go ahead and contract the economy right there. All right, so the final tool we're looking at here is open market operations. So the purchase and sale of government securities by the Fed in order to increase or decrease banks' excess reserves, that is called open market operations. It's the buying and selling of bonds by the Federal, the federal Reserve. So open market operations determines the federal funds rate, which is the interest rate that banks pay each other for overnight loans of federal funds. We already talked about that. The discount rate is the rate at which banks can borrow from the Federal, the federal Reserve. Um, the federal funds rate is the rate at which banks lend to each other, and that is set by open market operations, which once again is the Federal Reserve buying and selling bonds. So when the Federal Reserve buys bonds, excess reserves in the banking system increase, and therefore it's expansionary, and this is going to go ahead and lower nominal interest rates. When the Federal Reserve sells bonds, excess reserves in the banking system decrease, and it's therefore contractionary, and you're going to see an increase in interest rates. Another way you can think about it is um, when the Fed buys bonds, that's going to actually increase the price of the bond, which, according to bond theory, lowers the yield, and it's that yield that is very linked to interest rates. So that's another way you can think about it. But probably the easiest way to think about it is when you buy bonds, you create a bigger money supply. Those both start with B. So buy bonds, bigger money supply, that's going to lower nominal interest rates. Sell bonds, you have a smaller money supply. They both start with S. And that's going to increase nominal interest rates. So it's important to note that open market operations is the most used tool of monetary policy. Right now, the Federal Reserve uh, is using open market operations, buying and selling of bonds, to keep interest rates very low. 
uh, 0 to 0 0.25 percent and this affects what's called the prime rate which is linked to the rate at which we borrow for cars and houses and so forth so open market operations I can't emphasize enough how important that is uh, to setting interest rates in our economy so once again open market operations is the primary tool of monetary policy so why do banks need overnight loans banks are like any other business and that they seek to maximize profits. Banks make a profit by loaning out as much of their excess reserves as possible and charging interest to the borrower. If in the course of business they have loaned out all their excess reserves and do not have enough money to satisfy the required reserve ratio, then they must either borrow from the Fed's discount window, and they would borrow at the discount rate in that case, or they will more likely borrow from each other in the federal funds market. And remember, when they borrow in that market, they're borrowing at the federal funds rate, which is set by open market operations. So now, what I want to go ahead and do is I want to graph an expansionary monetary policy. And we're going to use three different graphs here. We're going to use a money market graph, linked to an investment um, demand graph, and then we're going to go ahead and show um, the effects of this expansion of monetary policy on ADAS graph. So let's take a look at this. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so here's what we've got. We've got at the top of our slide here, we've got a money market graph connected to an investment demand graph, and right below that investment demand graph, you have an ADAS graph, and there you have a recessionary gap. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and graph an expansionary monetary policy where the Federal Reserve is expanding the money supply, and that's going to have an effect on the money market graph, which is going to have an effect on investment demand, which is going to ultimately increase aggregate demand and get you back to full employment output. So remember that this expansionary monetary policy would be used to fight a recession. So taking a look at our money market market graph on the top left of our slide, you can see where our money supply intersects at our money demand. We have an equilibrium quantity of money and we have a nominal interest rate I. And as we connect that over to investment demand, uh, we have a level of investment, uh, which we have as a capital I right there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and increase the money supply and see how that's going to affect investment demand as well as the ADAS. So we're going to go ahead and increase the money supply here from MS to MS1. Okay, that's the part of the expansionary monetary policy. As you can see, uh, we have a new equilibrium after uh, we expand the money supply, uh, where MS1 hits MD, so our money supply 1 hits um, money demand. You can see we have a new novel interest rate, which is called I1, and a new quantity of uh, money, which we call Q1. So we connect that new, lower, nominal interest rate, I1 over, to our investment demand graph. And as you can see, we have a new level of investment, which is capital I1. And as you can see there, the level of investment has gone up. Now, what happened there is when the level of investment went up, that pushed up aggregate demand. So on our ADAS, uh, we had originally had an equilibrium price level of P and an equilibrium output of Y, which wasn't quite up to full employment output. But what ends up happening is with that increased amount of investment, that increases aggregate demand, aggregate demand moves back to full employment output. And as you can see, that pushed up the price level, that pushed up output, and alt uh, you're actually back at full employment output here. And what did you do? You got out of recession using this expansion and monetary policy. So let's go ahead and give a verbal description of what the Fed did and then what happened. So that's on the bottom left-hand corner here. So the Federal Reserve can buy bonds, they can lower the discount rate, they can lower the reserve requirement ratio. All three of those things uh, are part of an expansionary monetary policy. That's going to imply that excess reserves are going to go up. If these banks lend and the money is redeposited, that implies that the money supply is going to increase. 
which implies that your nominal rate of interest is going to go down, which implies that you're going to have more gross private investment and more consumption because it is now cheaper to borrow and invest and consume because nominal interest rates are lower, which implies that aggregate demand shifts to the right, which implies that you increased real GDP and you increased the price level. And ultimately, it is that increasing real GDP that's going to get you out of recession. All right, so let's take a look at this assessment here. Number one, we're going to describe the three tools of monetary policy discussed today. We've already discussed all three tools. Just go ahead and describe those three tools for me. That one should be pretty simple. Uh, second one, not as simple. So for number two, it says using a money market investment demand and ADAS graph. Graph and describe a contraction in monetary policy if the economy starts with an inflation gap. So the last um, slide, ladies and gentlemen, showed um, what would happen if you had an expansionary monetary policy using a money market investment demand and ADAS graph. Now we're going to go ahead and graph a contractionary monetary policy if you start with an inflationary gap. Because if there is inflation, then the Federal Reserve would use a contractionary monetary policy. So what I want you to go ahead and do is describe the three tools, what would be the three tools that would be used uh, in this contractionary monetary policy uh, to fight inflation. Then you're going to go ahead and graph those effects on a money market investment demand and ADAS graph. So with the money market graph, since this is a contraction of monetary policy, you're going to decrease the money supply, show what effect that has on investment demand, and then show me the effect it has on aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So once again, it's very similar to the last slide, but it is going to be the opposite because we're having a contraction of monetary policy starting with an inflationary gap. So be sure that you um, take a look at that. All right, so for the summary, in a paragraph, describe what you have learned today. I will check your notes. I'll check that you did numbers one and two, and I will check that you did your summary tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing you then. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.